Hi, everyone. We're happy that you're here with us today. I'm Debbie Kelly, a field specialist in horticulture located in Jefferson County. And we are really excited to start out a new year again uh, with what we used to call the Horticulture Town Hall. But after two years of being highly successful, we decided in our evaluation survey at the end of last year to let you guys decide what you wanted to call this. And you made a selection and we are now calling this the Garden Hour with MU Extension. So we're happy that you're here. We wish you all a happy new year. And what we're gonna do is kind of get jump started. I'm gonna go ahead and let Dr. Pat Ganan start us off with the weather report and then I'll come back and provide you with some additional information. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we'll let Dr. Pat Ganan go forth from here. Thank you, Debbie, and, and good morning, everyone. And uh, happy new year. We're, we're well into the month of January. And wow, when we last met in December, uh, it was uh, nothing short of incredible. I always like to look back to see where we've been. And December, if you thought it was a mild December, <laughs> it was, it was unprecedented in regard to the warmth. And what I have here is a little bit of a climatology in the We're upper We're not left. seeing your slides, Pat. Oh, you're not seeing the slides. Okay. Um, how about now? No. Still not yet. Okay. Let me, does that work? No, nope, I still don't see him. Okay. Mary Jennings is saying that she can see them. Oh, there it is, it's popping up. I see your email. All right, let me open up. I got a lot of stuff here. How about that? Yes, I can see it now, thank you. Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll quickly start over again. Thank you, thank you, Debbie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I was talking about how warm the month of December was, and indeed, uh, we can go back 127 years, all the way back to 1895. Right here, I'm circling with my arrow, 2021, unprecedented. It was the warmest December on record. And that actually beat the previous record from five years ago in 2015. So, uh, if you thought it was mild, it was something we haven't seen. And it was unprecedented in the upper right. Look at those numbers, departure from normals. Anytime you run double digits above normal for an entire month, you're likely gonna break a record. And that was the case. Um, just some amazing warmth. And not only for Missouri, the entire country set a record for the month of December when it came to warmth. Precipitation a little bit more tempered in regard to it was more seasonable. On the, here in the lower left, again, over the past 127 years, you can see just slightly below average in the precip category for the month of December. And on the lower right is a radar estimate showing those numbers uh, for the radar estimates for the month of December. A little bit wetter conditions as you work your way from, from northwest to southeastern parts of the state. That's classic climatology during the winter season. We, we generally see heaviest precip totals across southeastern parts of Missouri, and that was the case. Some decent rainfall, especially over the southeastern half. It had been dry across parts of Missouri, so that was welcome rainfall. It's a good time of year to recharge that soil profile, and we did get that across much of the southeastern half of the state and much wetter conditions, of course, as you went through southeastern Missouri. How about for the year? The year is, is pretty much following the trend of what we've been seeing over the past few decades. In other words, we've been getting warmer and we've been getting wetter. On the upper left shows the temperatures over the past 127 years. You can see right here, uh, 2021 above average, almost over two, two degrees above average for the year. 
uh, upper right shows uh, oh, for the January through to December, the uh, departure from normals. You can see we only had one cold spell and that was of course that really cold spell we had over the two week period last February. But as we went through the year, you can see, especially towards the fall, and of course that unprecedented warmth we saw in December, it was um, some very mild months over the past several months. Lower left shows how wet it's been over the past few decades. Our four out of our top five wettest years have all occurred since the early 1970s. 2021, again, averaged above average in the precip precipitation category. Lower right shows the monthly departures of precipitation for 2021. You can see we started out really wet for the first part of the growing season, starting from the spring into the well into July. A little bit drier conditions in August and September. Nice to see that rainfall in October because things were getting really dry and yet we had mild conditions, we had wet conditions. And so we got a lot of good renewed grass growth in October that was badly needed. Drier conditions in November and December. Well, we're getting Delta reality check and it doesn't really surprise me. We are gonna see occasionally, occasional incursions of Arctic air here during the winter time in Missouri. And we've been seeing that for January. And you can see in the upper left, this is departure from normal temperatures for the month of January so far that takes us through this morning. You can see colder conditions actually running below average across Northern parts of the state, a little bit more seasonable conditions so far for the month for central and Southern sections of Missouri. The upper right shows snowfall. We actually finally got a decent snowfall, our first big snow event just this past weekend. Uh, there was some snowfall earlier in the month across northern parts of the state, but you can see the totals generally uh, complements of what we saw this past weekend with that heavier snow, but they're generally running anywhere from four to over 10 inches, even a little bit of a, over a foot here in parts of northeastern Missouri for the month of uh, January for snowfall a little bit less. There was a pocket of heavier snow this weekend over around the Springfield to Branson area where they had anywhere from five to seven and a half inches of snow. But uh, again, a little bit more colder weather we're seeing, of course, compared to December, more opportunities for snowfall. Radar estimates in the lower right, again, showing that climatology where generally the southeastern parts of the state see the heaviest precip. That has been the case so far this winter and for the month of January. Uh, wetter conditions, uh, four to five inches already for the month of January here in southeastern parts of the state, especially in the Boot Hill. So some very wet conditions in that area as we go into the month of January. Well, the cold weather is here for the next couple of days. We are experiencing Arctic blast that came through the state last night. It's impacting our state today and on through the weekend. I think the coldest conditions, these are the forecasts over the next four days. That'll take us through Sunday, the high and low temperature. And you can see those cold conditions. Temperatures will be dropping today as we go uh, through the course of the day with temperatures only in the 20s, perhaps even in, only in the teens across northern Missouri. But you can see those forecast highs for tomorrow not getting out of the teens across northern Missouri, only into the lower 20s, low to mid 20s across the southern half of the state. A little bit of a moderation on Friday with uh, still, but still cold conditions in the teens and 20s and 30s across parts of the state. Warmer weather as we go into Saturday and Sunday. And I don't wanna forget those minimum temperatures. Look how cold it's gonna to be tomorrow morning here in the lower left, single digits, even below zero across Northern Missouri on Thursday morning. Again, single digits to below zero across much of the state on Friday morning and a little bit more moderation on Saturday and Sunday morning. I don't wanna, I do want to mention also, there is a wind chill advisory starting at 6 p.m. this evening through tomorrow morning where double digit wind chills could get as low as 20 degrees below zero, especially across Northern Missouri on strong winds out of the North, 20 to 25 miles an hour, that can create some dangerous cold conditions. So please be aware of that if you're gonna be venturing outside later this evening and on into tonight. Some very cold conditions, some of the coldest conditions we've seen in regard to wind chills for the year so far, for the winter season. Precipitation a lot less. It looks like these dry conditions are gonna persist over the next week or so. Little to no measurable precip across much of the middle part of the country. That includes most of Missouri. We do see some showers and snow showers actually impacting parts of Southern Missouri. Uh, they could see some uh, slick conditions later today as those temperatures drop and we start to see more freezing rain, perhaps even some snow that could cause some slick conditions. I do know there are winter weather advisories over parts of Northern Arkansas and on eastward into Kentucky and Tennessee. Nonetheless, just a little bit of ice can create some slick, slick conditions. And so be aware of that across Southern Missouri 
later today and on into this evening. This is the forecast for next week. It looks like this cold air is going to stick around. Uh, again, some moderation for the weekend, but still averaging a little bit below normal for this time of year. It looks like that's going to continue in the next week, next week with an enhanced likelihood of below normal temperatures across the eastern half of the country and dry conditions as noted in the, in the seven day outlook. A uh, little to no precipitation is anticipated in the next week with these colder conditions. I do wanna lastly mention that the new outlook for the month of February, as well as the seasonal outlook that'll take us into spring will be issued tomorrow by the Climate Prediction Center. So if you wanna look at the new outlooks coming for the next month, as well as into the spring, be sure to check out this web link below. I put a, a, a I put up a schedule showing when these forecasts are issued. The seasonal outlooks are only issued once a month. The monthly outlooks are issued twice a month. So Debbie, that's pretty much a weather report. Sorry about the rocky start, but I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We greatly appreciate you being on with us and, and informing us. And I didn't realize that December was the warmest on record uh, temperature wise. So that, that was, the thing that I picked up and I know my evergreens in December were kind of going water me please so I and I did so um what I'd like to also let folks know is um if you have questions uh from time to time and you're not sure who to contact this is who we are as a horticulture field specialist across the state along with our email addresses and there are some open positions so if you're in a county and there's no name listed there feel free to reach out to any one of us. We are more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, we did have quite a few questions that came in for us for this week, which um, was really exciting uh, to know that you guys are still thinking about gardening and still thinking about what to do with your house plants and your outdoor plants. And it's, it's fun for us to be able to answer those questions. So if you've got a question that you would like to have answered, you can go down to the very end here at ipm.missouri.edu forward slash town halls, and that will get you to where you originally registered for these, um, these meetings, and you'll have to register again. Don't worry, you'll, you won't get multiple emails, but that's where you go ahead and ask that question that will be answered for the next go around. What I'd like to do is go ahead and um, mention to you that um, the St. Charles County Extension chapter, Master Gardener chapter is doing what is called the Dig In and they're doing it virtual. And it is on February 26th. And you are more than welcome to sign up for that. Uh, the topics or themes are going to be on um, native plants and pollinators. If you're a Master Gardener and looking for continuing education, this might be something that you might like to attend as well. And so Tamara will drop that link into the chat box for us if she hasn't done so already. And then what I'd like to do is go ahead and turn it over to Kelly and she's gonna be our moderator for today. So Kelly, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you very much, Debbie. Um, and yes, I'll just uh, reiterate what Debbie said. We were really happy to get some questions from you all ahead of time. So keep submitting those from um, time to time, and we will certainly answer all that we have time for. So our first question today is about arborvitaes. And the question is, I have five arborvitaes. One is slowly losing its color. It's a pale green, not a bright green like the others. It is not yellow. Um, Pong Tien is going to answer this question. So Pong, what do you have for us? Hello everyone, this is Peng Tian. I'm the director of MU Plant Diagnostic Clinic. I did receive several uh, arborvitae samples in the winter and uh, some of them were um, totally fine and some of them have diseases. So every time we talk about arborvitae diseases, there are a couple of questions I want to ask. Uh, first, uh, were the plants were just planted last year or year before? The reason I'm asking is that uh, if the plants were newly planted recently, they might be experiencing some transplant shock. So the transplant shock and establishment issue may last for one to two years. So the trees may suffer from the new environment. 
Uh, they may eventually get better, but still they don't look pretty. At the same time, if you plant them too deep, they can cause roots uh, suffocation. Um, that can lead some discoloration. At the same time, if, if it's not deep enough, the roots may expose out, it will dry out and the plant will also perform poorly. So that's just based on the fact that the, the plant was newly planted. If it is not newly planted, I would say the primary reason may be associated with the irrigation or nutrition. So those are two things you need to check. And we have really warm winter. So uh, you, uh, I, I hope you have good irrigation for your plants. And of course, you don't want to underwater it or overwater it because overwater it can cause root issue and underwater will cause drought damage. So basically, that symptom can be reflected as a whole uh, tree symptoms. So you will, you will now see that the, the symptom like in pattern, your patches, you will see the entire plant getting discolored or losing color. So in very few cases, the pests such as the insects or fungal pathogen will become the primary issues uh, for the trees. So some fungal diseases attack the new growth and some attack the older growth and the leaves will turn to yellow or brown. They normally progress really fast and uh, they normally showed up like in patchy in segments, not like entire whole uh, tree. So that's something you can look out to see uh, whether your tree was infected partially or the whole plant. So recommendations. So check the irrigation, fertilization, inspect the tree thoroughly, and monitor the development of symptoms. Since you mentioned that the tree is still kind of losing color, not completely yellow or brown. So monitor the development of a symptom and watch out the spreading of the symptom to see whether the symptom showed up in the other four trees. That will tell us whether it was caused by the pathogen. So if you still have any questions, take more photos and send to us and we can work from there. And I would more than happy to uh, take samples and uh, for further tests or identification. Uh, that's all I have. And uh, I believe um, uh, the Dr. Rao will, uh, will provide my information about my lab and my uh, submission website. So, and that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, her next question is about tomatoes. So it's time to start thinking about what types of tomatoes you'll grow this year and maybe some issues that you had last year that you want to start addressing. And the first question that we have about tomatoes is, I've had trouble the last two years with tomato early blight and septoria. I cleared my tomatoes at the end of the season and disposed of the plants. I have raised beds. Would it be better to take off four to six inches of soil out of the beds and replace it with new soil? Um, or is covering up the soil with new soil enough? I'm also going to be diligent with mulch and spraying this year. So, Dr. Trinkline, what do you think about this? I think Dr. Trinkline's still with us. Yes, I'm sorry, Kelly, I was muted. That's okay. Um, it's the first one of the year. <laughs> uh, the two diseases that you mentioned are problematic year after year. Whenever possible, the easiest way to circumvent disease problems is to use genetically resistant varieties. Decades and decades of research have gone into trying to develop varieties resistant to early blight, Altenaria, and Orceptora, but we, we were about where we started oh, 50 years ago. But to address the question specifically, the inoculum is going to be on the surface of the soil in most cases. And the person who wrote the question uh, was using good sound practices 
in trying to clear out all of the diseased foliage and so forth. But let's face it, it's impossible to get everything off. And the buildup of an oculum is what happens, regardless of how meticulous you are, whenever you do tomato after tomato after tomato, as you might in a raised bed. To answer the question, bringing in a couple or three inches of new topsoil, if your raised bed will hold it, will be sufficient. The disease inoculum has no means of locomotion, meaning that it can't crawl to the top of the surface or so forth. It's when disease inoculum from these two organisms happen to be at the top and through splashing rain or other means are transferred to the leaves of the plant. And given the conditions are right, that's when we get infection. Uh, would like to warn the individual who raised the question, be very careful about the source of the topsoil that you bring in. Uh, anything that has been used to raise agronomic crops, especially uh, corn, where herbicides are used to control broadleaves, and tomato is a broadleaf, would be very suspect. So please investigate the history of the soil that you bring in. And I would also, if it were me, amended with a bit of organic matter to loosen it. Most Missouri topsoils, even though they might be fertile, do lack an organic matter, and especially in drainage for a raised bed. S putting on straw is a very good management practice to help prevent the splashing of soil to the leaves. And as well, if necessary, the use of chemicals, in this case, fungicides, to try to control. The fungicide that we most often recommend would be any one that has as an active ingredient chlorothalonil, C-H-L-O-R-O-T-H-A-L-I-N-A-L. Uh, that's a new generation fungicide, not like the older heavy metals that uh, were a bit more toxic toward people, but we find it to be very effective. So again, since this is a program sponsored by IPM, or Integrated Pest Management, using a series of tactics to manage these diseases is what we recommend. And the first being, if you can, rotation of the planting site in your garden to eliminate the inoculum. In the case of this question, that's going to be accomplished by bringing new non-contaminated soil in. But from there, keeping the leaves dry, soil from splashing up on them, and then finally, if necessary, to use an effective fungicide, which fungicides are preventative, they're not curative. So when we see the first sign, what we're trying to do with a fungicide is to keep the disease from spreading from diseased leaf to healthy leaf. Kelly, I hope that helps. It's a bit long-winded, but nonetheless, I wanted to put the caution in about bringing in just any topsoil. I have seen some very unfortunate results, especially with tomato. Yeah, I have too. Now, that was great information. Um, we had a question in the chat. Can you use grass clippings instead of straw? I... Uh, Again, depending upon the history of the grass clippings, um, for those who uh, essentially don't use any kind of systemic herbicide, 
that would be probably fine. I, I would prefer that they be dry though, simply because grass clippings, whenever they tend to be wetted, maybe by a spring rain, tend to mat down and uh, kind of form an impervious mass. But if you dry the grass clippings and they're herbicide free, that would be just fine. Just anything to do two things, to form a layer over the soil surface, which will help retard weeds and if you will, conserve water. But more importantly, for the sake of disease prevention, it will prevent the introduction of possible inoculum onto our healthy tomato plants. And I often get questions about grass clippings used as a mulch about, you know, the fact that they're fresh, are they gonna tie up a lot of nitrogen in the soil to help them break down? Um, do you have any comments on that? Well, when we talk about composting, we talk about browns and greens. Uh, the browns, and a good example of that would be leaves shed in the fall, would be a source of carbon. In the greens, including grass clippings, a source of nitrogen. And then, of course, the microbes that break down the carbon use the nitrogen from grass clippings. Uh, don't think that it's a reliable enough source of nitrogen for the sake of composting, uh, we'll say according to the books. And by that, a matter of making sure that the pile heats to 140 degrees, turning it and so forth. So while grass clippings in a compost pile will help, they might not have sufficient nitrogen for the microbes to totally break down the carbon that they also contain. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, Dr. Trinkline, we have one other question about tomatoes, but I really think you've already answered it. It's mainly about soil-borne soil fungal diseases, and I think you've pretty much covered all of yeah, the I, I saw yeah. that in advance, Kelly, and you, yeah. you're right. That there really wasn't enough information. Uh, is this a soil-borne disease that attacks the root system or attacks the shoot system? Now, in well, all it, cases, sanitation is very, very important. If it attacks the root system, and a good example would be fusarium wilt, that's soil borne, it attacks the roots, and then the organism is translocated up inside the plant. So there is no chlorothalonil or anything that's going to prevent the blockage of vascular tissue in the wilt, and ultimately the death of the plant. So there, there really wasn't quite enough information there to make, uh, a, a definitive statement of what might be done because we don't know was the individual, or if, and if you're on, perhaps you can tell us in the chat box, is the, uh, are the symptoms, I should say, start from the bottom, typical of the blight and so forth, the yellowing, necrotic spots, and then working their way up then I would say, well, yes, the things I had just mentioned would apply for that as well. If indeed it's a root disease that is translocated up, uh, frankly, then we've got problems. The good news is there is very wide array of genetically resistant tomato varieties to fusarium wilt, verticillium wilt and other soil borne diseases. Unfortunately, if you're a fan of heirloom varieties, then you're gonna be fighting these diseases because heirlooms do not have the genetic resistance. So maybe if the person can type in, if the symptoms were indeed what we 
suspect it probably was a matter of one of the two wills, Altenaria or Septura. All right, very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, our next question this week was about purple fountain grass. And certainly this is a popular landscape plant. And the question is, is will it return in the spring? Uh, Jennifer, what do you have for us? Yes, that is a good question. Will my purple fountain grass return in the spring? And the answer is no, it won't return in the spring because it is not hardy to Missouri. It is hardy to zone nine. So here in Missouri, it is an annual. So you have to treat it like an annual and it's not going to make it through our Missouri winters. And just a little more details about uh, fountain grass, uh, purple fountain grass. Um, it's a pretty plant uh, to have and you can grow it in a container. You can grow it in your landscape bed. You don't have to have any special soil for it. It'll grow in, you know, just average soil. It does need uh, sun or part sun and it won't get real big, you know, about 30 to 36 inches in height and a spread of about 20 or, or 12 to 24 inches. So there you have it. Nope, you cannot get purple fountain grass to make it through a Missouri winter. All right, thank you very much. And that's all, Kelly. Okay, thank you. Um, if, you know, if whoever submitted the question, if you are interested in ornamental grasses that do come back year after year, there are types that will, that are hardy to Missouri. Um, and we should have some guide sheets on those, or you can reach out to one of us and we can um, suggest some cultivars for you. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna talk about today is starting seeds indoors and winter sowing. And Donna Oftenberg is going to share some information with us about that. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, so right now is the time when everybody's starting to think about spring. Good. We have a clean slate um, and a lot of people are wanting to um, start seeds for their garden. And so we thought that it might be helpful to talk about some of those seed starting options and one in particular uh, winter sowing. And I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But just to give a review, um, now's the time to be flipping through those catalogs. If you haven't already um, ordered your seeds, get them ordered immediately. Uh, I keep hearing from all these seed companies that you know, their supplies are limited to order now. And I would follow that direction pretty close. Um, get going and order your seeds if you haven't already done it. And so right now, um, think about all the things that you would be needing for seed starting. Um, so think about um, your plan, how, when you want your seeds to be ready. Um, I always try to get people to think about their um, hardiness zone, um, get you a calendar, um, and calendars are relatively cheap. You can even print them off the internet um, at, at some websites. And so I usually print off February, March, April, and May, and then I start figuring out when am I going to plant my tomatoes? When am I going to plant my, um, you know, my cool crops? So the, the thought would be you figure out the date that you want to plant them in the ground and then you count back um, the number of days um, it's going to take till harvest. And so, I'm sorry, to the days um, that you need to transplant them. So for example, for tomatoes, um, it takes about six to eight weeks to have a tomato ready for the ground. And so you would pick your day um, that you want to plant it and you would count back those six to eight weeks. Um, that's just a prime example. If you look at the bottom of the screen, there are um, many crops listed there and the number of weeks that you need to plant them uh, before transplanting. And so those charts really um, are pretty handy. Um, but definitely plan. I know I usually try to start my tomatoes the second week of March. Um, I try to start my cold crops the end of January, beginning of February. So the basic thing is do your research, find out when these things need to be planted. The other thought is consider how you're going to plant them. Um, are you going to broadcast them? That's in the upper left-hand side. I, I love using what we call strip trays where you can get 20 varieties in a tray. That's upper right-hand. Um, 
corner. You can find those um, on Amazon and a variety of different garden catalogs. Um, they are a little pricey, but they last several years and they work really well. Um, or you could even be sewing into the six packs or the pots. The other way I like to do it is winter sewing, and that's where you're utilizing milk jugs um, to start things like perennials and wildflowers. And I'll talk about that one here in a second. Um, remember um, definitely to consider these things when you're starting seeds in the spring. Make sure your pots all have holes, even if you're recycling containers, like yogurt containers, sour cream containers. If you're wanting to go that and recycle, um, make sure you put holes in them. Um, make sure to use a good potting mix or a good seed starting mix. And preferably ones that do not have fertilizer already added in them. You want um, just regular old good old fashioned potting mix. Um, remember to manage your temperature based on what you're growing. So if it's tomatoes, you're gonna be keeping them on the warmer side. If you're doing the lettuce or the, the cold crops such as broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, it's gonna be on the cooler side. And do your research to find out what they need. Um, and remember, lights are essential. Um, good lighting, whether it's a bright sunny window, whether it's fluorescent lights, like what's in the picture over to the right. Um, or, and also remember moisture management can make or break seedlings. So if it's too wet, they can die. If it's too dry, they can dry, uh, die. So it's very important, regardless of the way you start your seeds, make sure you're checking on them a couple of uh, times a day. And that way you know that they have adequate moisture. Now, I know I hear a lot of people saying they have troubles with starting um, perennials and wildflowers and harder to germinate seeds. Well, one method I really like is what we call winter sowing. And that's when we're taking a milk jug, cutting it in half, and we're sowing seeds in it, and we're, we have a little mini greenhouse. And so all that warming up, freezing, warming up, freezing over a several week period will actually help these perennials and wildflowers to germinate. Over to the right that we have the actress that is um, starting, um, that has been started. And so it works really well for a lot of our wildflowers. And just to give you an overview, cut um, a milk jug in half. Um, you leave a little bit of a lip there, or I'm sorry, a hinge there. Um, and um, then you poke holes in the bottom and then you can put soil in it. You wanna fill the soil up to um, two, three inches, about an inch from the top of, of the cut edge. And so this is, once again, you're using a potting mix. And so once you've uh, sowed your seeds in there, um, uh, you're going to sprinkle um, more soil over the top and pat it down, make sure it's good seed to soil contact. And then you're gonna tape that cut back closed. And then once you um, tape it closed um, and you make sure it's watered in, I'm sorry, I forgot that part. Then you can put them in a protected location. Uh, make sure that they get sun though, because you want that heating up, that cooling down over several weeks. Make sure that they're um, secured in location, that they're not going to get blown over. No critters are going to come to knock them over. And then you want to check them weekly for moisture. And all I do is peer down into the hole of the milk jug. So you are actually removing that cap of the milk jug and it stays off. And so that way rain and moisture gets down and it does have a vent when it warms up. And don't worry, they're not going to, that, that freezing and thawing is what we want. So don't worry about it getting too cold. But at, after about six to eight weeks, you're going to start seeing little green specks of, of plants popping up. And so it's, it's a really fun method. It's an easy method. And there are lots of resources out there for um, sewing in the winter sewing method. So um, I hope everybody tries it and enjoys planting. Okay. All right. Thank you, Donna. Okay, I'm going to circle back around just really quickly. Uh, Dr. Treekline, if you're still with us, we had a, a question come up in the chat about grafted tomatoes right. and uh, how they kind of play into soil-borne root diseases and does it make the fruiting part of the plant resistant as well? It's a very good question, Kelly. Uh, graft stock, and by that we mean what will be the root part, would be 
interspecific hybrids of tomato. And uh, as such, they do go uh, and bloom and set fruit, but it's frankly not very tasty. It's used primarily for the vigor and in the case of discussion here, the disease resistance of the uh, grafted tomato. There is some discussion whether or not you still have an heirloom if you graft an heirloom, and let's use brandy wine on uh, a rootstock, and we'll use Maxifort, that's a very popular one, because there are things that the rootstock will add to the brandy wine that brandy wine's own roots will not. But by and large, it's an effective way to get around the lack of resistance in heirlooms. And still to, I think, about 90 whatever percent have that same heirloom taste, quality, or why ever you decided to grow it. Uh, this is something that uh, is increasingly being pursued with research wise and practicality wise. And uh, I think disease resistance at this point probably is for the home gardener, the primary reason to use grafted tomatoes. And they're available on uh, the, the, the open market, if you will, yard and garden centers, retail greenhouses and so forth. Or if you want the ultimate gardener's challenge, you can graft your own. And uh, there are some very good videos on YouTube put out by Dr. Kerry Rivard, R-I-V-A-R-D, Kansas State University, that explains the entire grafting process. Might wanna check it out. All right, thank you very much. Okay, next is our insect friend or foe segment. Uh, Tamara, what do you have for us this week? All right, so hopefully you can see my screen. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. Is this a friend or foe? So I just put the, put the poll up. I'm gonna give you guys about 10 seconds to click on friend, foe, or neither, or it depends. All right, get your last votes in. I'm gonna end the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. All right, so hopefully you can see the results now. It looks like most of you thought that it was a foe. Um, some of you say neither, and sometimes it's a depends. So let me share with you what I just determined. It is a little bit tricky when we do these things because often it depends on what environment we're talking about. I went ahead and put this as a foe because most of the time people are going to come across this and it's going to be in their, in their house. So this is a silverfish. It's also known as a fire brat. There are lots of different types. There's actually about 550 known species. Um, and when they get into our house, the few, few species that get into our house, um, they, they can cause problems. Overall, um, they're pretty much carrot-shaped, somewhat flattened um, insects that are wingless. They do have these grayish type scales that if you um, handle one, you'll, you'll see those. They have these long slender antennae um, right up here, and then they have these three very slender appendages on the back. Like I said, they're wingless, so they can't fly, but they do move rather quickly, even though when it's kind of a stop and go, they'll move really fast for a short interval and then, and then they stop and then they keep going. Um, like I said, there are many, and, and actually most that are found outdoors, they, you don't really come across them. Um, they often hide, such as like under the tree bark, um, they can be under rocks, they can even be in nests of animals. So if, if you come across one outside, just let it be, it's, it's not a pest. However, in households um, or in, in our, our, our dwellings, 
they can actually cause problems. They can feed and cause damage to a variety of materials. And it can be plant origin, it can be some protein. Um, often it's, it's the glue in book bindings. It can be behind wallpaper, it can be on paper, it can be on cereal grains, it can even be dried meat. Um, it's, they can even damage silk um, and some synthetic fabrics. So um, just so you know, they're typically found in dark places. Um, they're most active at night, but they can be found everywhere. Um, if you find them in your bathroom, it's usually because they fell in there while they were seeking moisture. So that's, that's good to know when you're looking for control options because prevention's better than cure. Try to not bring them in your house. But if you do have them, if you reduce the humidity and decrease the temperature, you're more likely to not have them. Um, chemical control might be necessary if you do have a bad infestation. And so you're gonna use something with a, a pyrethroid or boric acid. Um, these are often over the counter, but you do need to be very careful. You need to follow that label. Remember that label is the law, it's there to protect you. Um, so anyway, this is, this is typically a foe when it's in your house, but it's not, it's not really serious, but um, it's, it is a foe. So uh, there you go. That's all I have today. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Okay, so our next topic today is a little bit about elderberries. So if you've ever grown elderberries before, you may have some bags of elderberries in the freezer right now, and you may be wondering what to do next. So uh, Jennifer and I are going to share some ideas with you, and Jennifer, why don't you go first? Sure, Kelly, I'd be glad to. So I've grown elderberries for several years, probably, gosh, probably close to about eight years now. And just in recent years, you've probably noticed when you go to a grocery store or a pharmacy, um, you know, a department store, you know, like uh, Walmart, Walgreens, Target, some of those places, um, on the shelf, there's a lot more elderberry products than there used to be. And I put some photos up here of some of the products that you might be seeing now. You can find uh, gummies, uh, which, you know, it, it says, you know, gummies with vitamin C and zinc. Um, you know, I've seen that a lot at the different stores. I've seen cough drops like I have here in the, the center of the slide. And I found uh, this elderberry juice uh, at our local Hy-Vee store here in uh, Kirksville. And it was uh, produced by a local uh, Missouri elderberry farm. So that they be, become very popular in the last uh, few years. So what do I do with my frozen elderberries? So we know um, some of you may have frozen elderberries uh, in your freezers and you're wondering how do you process them or what, what do you do with them? What can you make with them? And I, like I said, have grown them for about eight years. And before that, I was harvesting them from, well, from ditches, really, uh, and around creek areas, you know, because they like wet, uh, they like wetter areas. So I was harvesting native elderberries, and then I uh, planted some of the extension office here in Adair County, and I planted some at my house. So now I have access to, um, to plants, and I don't have to go you know, around the county looking for them in ditches anymore. Okay, so they're typically harvested July through August. Here in Northeast Missouri, it's usually August. And it just happens to always be right around Missouri State Fair time when I'm busy uh, with, with that. But in the Southern part of the state, I think they are ready, and Kelly can talk more about this. I think they're ready in, in July, uh, mid to late July. But up here in Northeast Missouri, if you're from this part, they're probably not gonna be ready in your, in your uh, elderberry plot until probably the early part of August through mid-August. And then I, I pick them, my kids will help me pick them and we bag them and I freeze them because like I said, I am busy at that time with fairs, my kids show sheep and I don't have time to process them at all. So I pick them and I put them in my deep freeze uh, freezer. And before I do that, I will spread them out on a cookie sheet, or at least I try to. This year, we were so busy, I just picked them, put them in bags, and put the bags in the freezer. And that is not a good idea because they get all tangled up and just become a massive tangled up mess in the bags. So 
if you have the time, it's best to spread them out on a cookie sheet and then put them in your freezer and, and let them freeze and then take them off the cookie sheet and put them back in bags. Because when you get ready to process them, it will be a lot easier to deal with them that way versus just like I had to do this past summer, just throw them in the bag and they become all tangled up. Okay. So then I store them in the freezer until I am ready to process them. And here in the last few years, it's usually been Labor Day weekend when I, I've had the time to finally get around to, to processing them. But, you know, it might be Christmas break before you might have time or, you know, just it, it doesn't matter. I, I don't think you ought to wait a year because some of our fruits do get freezer burned. So I think a year might be a little excessive to have them in your freezer. So I would probably encourage you to do it within about six months. And then how long does it take to process them? Well, it takes me about half a day. So it, it really depends on how many berries you have to juice. And I usually have lots of Walmart or Hy-Vee sacks like you see here in the picture. This is from, oh, probably five years ago. My son, this son is now 11 and he's probably five or six in that picture. So that's from a few years ago, but I'll have lots of bags. I have them in my freezer. And it takes me about half a day to, to get everything juiced, or I do it over the course of several days even. Um, but if you just have a bag or two, you can probably get it done in about an hour, hour and a half. And here's a cookie sheet where I've spread out the berries. They still kind of look like they're in a, you know, a, a, a kind of in a tangled mess. But this process of doing it, putting them on a cookie sheet is better than just throwing them all in the bag and, and leaving them that way. So I've some years tried to put them on cookie sheets like this. I freeze them and then I put them back into bags. And then on the right side, you see what's called a, a juicer, a, a three, like a three pot juicer. The bottom part, part is the boiling water. So you put water in that bottom half, it, it boils. The middle section is what uh, catches the juice. And then the top part of that is a, oh, it, it's a, I guess you'd, it, you'd say it's a call, it's a colander and you stick all your berries in there. And then the juice, um, it, it falls through to that middle pan. So that steam, that heat, that steam goes up through the pans and it creates the juice and the juice, um, goes in that middle pan. And then it comes out the tube. You can see a tube um, coming out there on the on the left of that juicer, and there is a a thing on here that uh, keeps the juice from coming out until you press it. So moving on, I cut the stems apart as much as I can. So that's a question people have had. What do I do with the stems? So there are, there's a lot of stems with elderberries, and you want to try to get rid of all the big stems or as much stem as you can but you are not going to get rid of all those stems. It's just nearly impossible. And what I do is I shake the berries against my top part portion of that juicer. Um, I shake them and then I also have to pull, I pull them off. Uh, I pull them off the main stem. So, you know, I'm cutting, I'm pulling. It's a process, it really is. And like I said, I, I leave a lot of those little stems. It's, it's okay to do that. Um, there's not enough cyanide in there that's going to harm you. And Kelly's going to talk about cyanide here in just, just a minute. Um, but it's okay if you have a bunch of those little fine stems in there because it's just nearly impossible to get rid of them all. So then I juice the berries uh, with those little stems in there. And like I said, I put them in the top part of that juicer, which is like a colander. And you can also use a pot. If you don't have a juicer, you may be thinking, well, I don't have a juicer. And I will tell you those juicers, um, they're a little pricey. They're around $100. You can buy them off Amazon. You can also find them at um, little country stores. Uh, around here in Northeast Missouri, we have um, little stores out in the country where we can purchase uh, juicers and just kind of unusual things that you might not find at a store like Walmart, okay? So, uh, that, that's where you can get them, um, but you can also use a pot. In December, I wanted to make some blackberry syrup to, to give as a Christmas gift. So I just used a pot. I didn't even use my juicer. And I put the blackberries in there, which you can do the same with the elderberries. Put your elderberries in your pot and put a little water in there. And then you can use a cheesecloth to strain out the elderberry juice. And I should mention that I 
I also use grated ginger. So two years ago, I was visiting our first elderberry farm in Schuyler County, which is up here on the Iowa border. And the owner of the farm told me that he was putting in um, grated ginger and cinnamon. And he gave me a sample and it was good. Uh, it, was, it was better than just straight, straight juice. So that's what I've been doing for the last two years is putting in some grated ginger uh, root and cinnamon in the top portion of that colander. Okay, so as it juices down, the ginger and the cinnamon go through um, through um, with the juice. Okay, so when it goes into my jars, that's all getting mixed in. And if uh, you you know fill jars, if you're going to fill your jars, your canning jars, you must water bath it for at least ten minutes, or you can freeze jars. And I never knew this until my mom, who is uh, down in Texas County. She's had master gardener training and she grows some elderberry plants and she's like, just freeze your elderberry um, juice in the jars rather than heating up your house. Because I do, I, I do other canning and, you know, it, it does heat up the house for a long time. So anyway, I started freezing my elderberry, um, elderberry juice in the mason jars, but make sure that they are not too full because sometimes I've had them too full and they will crack. But if you do not get them too full, if you leave about an inch ahead space, they will not crack. And then when I want a jar, I just pull it out of the freezer, set it on the counter, and it thaws out. And we've been using a lot of it here in the last year or so. And it's, it's been good to have around. I do notice that it, it does help. Um, it does, you know, just it just, um, for example, if I have a slight sore throat coming on, you can kind of sometimes tell when that's coming on. If I drink elderberry juice, within about three hours, those symptoms are going away. Or, or they're gone. So uh, I really do feel like it has a lot of helpful benefits. Now I wanted to show you, here's the juicer and some of the, the juice in the jars. And then after it's um, juiced, after you get all the juice out of those berries, you're gonna be left with a bunch of pulp and, and stems like you see here on the left side. And you can make things like elderberry pancakes, elderberry muffins, and jam or jelly. So the photo on the right is some jam that I made. And I have also tried a, a cake, like a coffee cake with elderberries. And that's all I had uh, or have. I would be glad to answer any questions. And I would also welcome any emails. If you guys want to send me an email, call me at the Adair County Extension Center. Like I said, I've been doing this for about eight years. And I, I really enjoy it. So contact me if you have any questions. And Kelly, back to you. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Very interesting. So I know we're running low on, low on time, but mine is very, very short. So let me just share a little bit of additional elderberry information with you. All right. First thing I want to say is please, 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 please make sure that you actually have elderberries. Um, there are some other naturally occurring berries out there that are purple and that sometimes get confused for elderberries. Um, the picture here on the left shows elderberries as opposed to pokeberries. Elderberries grow on a shrub, a woody shrub. And you can see here that the shape of the fruit cluster is kind of a, an umbral shape. So it's kind of a rounded sign is what the official term for it is. And pokeberries form on kind of a drooping bottle shaped cluster. And pokeberry is also a deciduous green plant that dies back to the ground every year. And they do have some toxic properties. And hackberries also can resemble elderberries as well, but they grow on a tree. So they're pretty easy to differentiate between elderberries. And if you ever need help identifying berries, certainly reach out to one of us. We will, we, we can help with that. But the number one rule is to make sure that you actually are using elderberries. So I do something similar to Jennifer. I make my own juice, but I just destem my frozen elderberries. You can just 
leave them in a, I leave mine in a Ziploc bag. I kind of bang them on the counter and most of the berries will fall away from the, the clusters to make them easier to kind of de-stem. And then I put those de-stemmed berries into a pot on the stove and I just use a low boil. And if you don't wanna to use too much heat because that can um, dissipate some of the health benefits of the berries, but I just use a low boil and a potato masher and I just kind of mash the berries and then I strain the juice. And, and then once I have my juice, I freeze mine in ice trays. And so I have little um, ice shaped frozen berry juice. And then if you've ever had raw elderberry juice or frozen elderberry juice, it doesn't taste the best. So what we do is we put it in lemonade and it makes a great refreshing drink and it's a good way to get your, your juice um, that way. And then you can also dry berries and make teas. And I'm not going to get into too much of elder flowers today, but you can also dry flowers and make tea as well. Now we do get a lot of questions about cyanide and elderberry plants do contain, contain cyanide. And the University of Missouri has been studying this for several years and they actually published a peer reviewed publication on this a few years ago. So if you wanna read more about it, you can certainly look this up. But in a nutshell, you would have to eat large amounts of the plant to get enough cyanide to hurt you. So it's not that much of a concern. Um, but here's a, a title of that publication if you do want to read more about it. So, Debbie, that's all I have. Thank you. I know um, some different uh, producers that are growing elderberries, and it, it's fun and interesting to, to see their, their products. And I have had that juice that Jennifer had shown, and it is, it's good. And it, it, it did work one time when I wasn't feeling well, and I felt better later. So in closing for today, we want to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, remember that we're doing this on a monthly basis during the non-growing season. Again, on the screen is our names and our email addresses, but I'm going to go real quick to the next slide just to let you know that in February, we're going to be meeting on February 16th, a Wednesday from noon to 1 p.m. If you've got a question, again, you can go to the ipm.missouri.edu forward slash town halls and sign up again. And then we have our live stream as well as our snippets. And we'll have a new snippet out there. And if you want to refresh your memory on maybe what Dr. Trinkline had to say or more about elderberries or something else that was said today, you can go out onto our live stream, which it will will be archived, so you'll be able to go out there and watch it. And again, fill out this. And here is our contact information. And thank you very much for joining us. And we hope to see you next month.